In the remote jungles of Myanmar lives a creature known for centuries as the lifeblood of the country's timber business. If you use the elephant, you have no need a wider road, not like a car, not like a heavy duty machine. With their immense strength, these elephants can haul logs with minimal damage to the forest. They have survived wars and decades of dictatorship. But now, the future of Myanmar's timber elephants and their handlers is at risk. In order to make money, we have to fire some employees. Since logging extraction is reduced, they will be fired. With the Myanmar government drastically reducing timber extraction by 2014, livelihoods are on the line. Yes, we are suffering because we have been working in this industry for a long time. After decades of lost opportunities, today Myanmar is racing to catch up. Some of the changes sweeping through the country are wrenching and will reach far corners. I'm Nirmal Ghosh. On this edition of 101 East, we gain rare access to remote logging camps and ask, is this the end of Myanmar's timber elephants? For centuries, Myanmar's tropical hardwood has been in demand across the world. In the colonial era, it was used to build the British naval fleet. Today, Burmese teak furniture fetches thousands of dollars in the open market. The durability and density and also the other color and then the grain and also the size of the tree. The, we are the, right now, we are the cutting the very right size not the, just a small plant, small tree in the there. This is also important. At this workshop in the city of Yangon, valuable old teak from demolished buildings is recycled into high-end furniture. Owner La Tong started the business in 1999 and has seen a boom in sales. He says customers sometimes wait up to a year because of the huge volume of orders for customized pieces. The wood used is almost 100 years old. Definitely at the time they, they used elephant for their wood extracting. While the rest of Southeast Asia has stopped elephant timber logging, a remarkable 60% of Myanmar's timber is extracted by elephants. The country is one of the biggest exporters of teak with three quarters of the global market. But this is about to change. I have come to Myanmar at the cusp of a major transformation in its timber industry. The country will have a complete ban on raw timber exports by April 2014, allowing only exports of finished products. Log extraction will also be reduced by almost half. This will help Myanmar curb deforestation, encourage the domestic furniture industry, and earn carbon credits on the international market. But the new policy could signal the end of an era for Myanmar's timber elephants and their handlers. The handlers might be worried. Even the government servants in office are worried. When logging extraction is reduced, whatever is not economical will be eliminated. Even with selective logging, forest cover has drastically shrunk in Myanmar to below 30%. Much of this is due to illegal logging. In the last two years, authorities have seized almost 70,000 tons of illegal logs. We take immediate action against them by using the police, the forestry department, investigators, and also by us. But it is still happening. We hope that if we can protect the forest from illegal logging and limit log extraction, we can keep our jobs longer.
Tun Tun U is in charge of logging in Western Myanmar's Ayurwadi division. He says with reduced logging, private elephant owners contracted by the government will be the first on the chopping block. I think there are around 70 to 80 small and big companies that have been working for a long time. When timber production is reduced, even though we are in a better position, we will suffer some side effects. The private elephant owners will also be affected. I don't know how they plan to manage it, but they will be affected. There will be a stage when they may think it's not economically viable because they can no longer export. So which are the elephants you inherited from your parents? I meet Sa Mu, a second generation elephant owner. He inherited three elephants from his parents. The stable has now grown to 20, including six calves. But with higher operation costs, his profits have fallen. And now he is concerned the reduced logging could ruin him. I am not prepared for this. It puts me in a tight spot. Yes, we are suffering because we have been working in this industry for a long time. We should be supported and given help. <clears throat> the elephants have made a big mark in this country's history. They make a large amount of money for this country. It's quite inappropriate to abandon the private owners at this time. Somu fears the family business is about to end in his hands. We are in a situation where we have to sell our elephants. But if the government does not help us, we have no choice. We will just release them into the jungle. I'm worried for them because it might be dangerous to release them. I also don't want to do that because I'm strongly attached to them. Myanmar is home to close to 5,000 elephants in captivity. While some are handled by private owners like Saw Mu, more than half are in the hands of a single government logging agency, the Myanmar Timber Enterprise. Much of the story of the timber elephants begins here in its Yangon office. Good morning. Uh, hello, Mr. Nima. Yeah. It's so nice to see so you again. So to see you. Hi. How are you doing, doctor? I'm fine. Good. I meet two veterinarians, Dr. Myo Tan and Dr. Myo Nezar, experts on caring for these giant, intelligent animals. This elephant diary records the life cycle of the elephant from birth to death. The vet's records are meticulous. The diaries date back to the 1930s. This is possibly the most extensive elephant archive in the world. Nowadays, we can record by taking photographs, but in the past there were no cameras. We recorded based on the elephant's height, posture, weight, structure, ears, eyes and so on. This diary is about an elephant who is 66 years old. The book ends when the elephant dies. So how often do you go out to inspect elephants? For me, I usually travel to each area once every other month. The next morning I joined Dr. Myone Zar for the long journey to a remote forest camp to inspect the elephants. It will be a rare opportunity to see these mighty mammals at work. It is a sight few outsiders have seen. We have to bring in our own supplies, food and water. It's a day's drive, heading north from Yangon to Tietsan, the base camp where the elephant handlers live. From there we will need to travel on foot with elephants carrying our supplies for another 50 kilometers into the mountains. Dr. Myonezar and his colleagues are used to traveling long distances, day and night, and are happiest out in the field. We love to treat and take care of the elephants. To live with and help the elephant handlers and their families gives us joy and happiness. Hey, 
This is Tayet San, home to 52 of the famed timber elephants and their handlers, or Uzis as they are called in Burmese. Among them is Zong Wen, a third generation Uzi, who leads a team of four handlers and their elephants. As a young boy, Zong Wen dreamt of becoming an Uzi. It was his father who first put him on an elephant. <laughs> My father loved to talk about elephants, and he enjoyed his job. Zawin takes me to the extraction site, deep in the forest, to see his elephants at work. It will be an arduous trek. With their sure-footed strength, the elephants steadily navigate the rugged terrain. This journey is very much as it was in the colonial era, when around 10,000 elephants were involved in logging and transporting supplies. Zowen's grandfather may well have ridden this very same route. When Japan invaded Burma in World War II, timber elephants were taken off active duty and turned to rescue missions. In one instance, 110 elephants helped 67 British women and children evacuate from central Myanmar to northeast India. In another remarkable feat, Elephants were sent from neighboring Assam in India to rescue refugees fleeing the Japanese invasion. When these mountain rivers rise, elephants are the only way across. It is easy to see how valuable these animals are in this challenging environment. It has taken us two days of trekking through the jungles of the Arakan Yoma, the Arakan Mountains, to get to this spot, a remote logging camp, where six elephants and six Uzis spend about half the year during the monsoon season extracting logs. Out here, the Uzis live simply, relying on nature. They shower in the open using rainwater, and food is brought in around once a month. Temporary huts are built from the surroundings using rattan, cane, and bamboo. Life out here can be harsh. Malaria is a constant concern. Zawen lost his father when he developed a fever deep in the forest. He was too far away from hospitals to receive any treatment. The Uzis have to work in the rain, in the wind and in the sun. We have to station the elephants in the deep jungle. We need to live far away from our families and in a harsh environment. Sometimes we face a shortage of food. Whatever the situation, we need to be able to deal with it. It is a tough life. It's a tough life built on a routine that has existed for centuries. Early each morning, the Uzis must look for their elephants, who roam free in the forest overnight, foraging for food, but rarely wandering very far. The next ritual is a pleasant one, the daily bath. This is important for a captive elephant's skin hygiene and also reinforces the bond between Uzi and elephant. The relationship is like parents and children. Elephants are like parents and we have to respect them as they provide us with everything. Therefore, the Uzi needs to take care of them, so they are in good health. 36-year-old Tusker Sui Chor Te is the star here and often leads the team. Caught from the wild, harsh training was used to break his spirit. The handlers tell us his nature is placid, 
and it only took a month to teach him the unique commands. Many elephants require force before they comply. The Uzi needs to know the nature of his elephants. Some of them are nice, while others are wild. But the Uzi will be gentle with nice elephants and violent with wild ones. But violence is not always needed. Sometimes the Uzi needs to give the elephant a treat before he uses it. If the Uzi keeps treating them harshly, the work will not be done. Which tree is it? That tree. That one? Okay. Uh, the name is Pingru. Pingru? Yeah. In Magad, they call Myanmar Ironwood. Myanmar Ironwood. Yeah. So Yi Mon Lin is the ranger officer in charge of this extraction site. He shows me a tree meant for felling, which has been marked by the forest department. How does the forest department decide which tree to cut? According to the Myanmar selection system, the forest department measures the tree's girth at the height of a man's chest. They mark the timber that has grown to a size ready to be cut. The team quickly gets to work. The wood is stamped to show it has been legally cut. Then it's showtime for the elephants. On the forest floor, Uzi and elephant work as one unit, combining intelligence, training, precision and enormous strength. Uzis control their elephants with vocal commands and also using their knees, feet and occasionally a stick, encouraging the three-ton giants to yield and work. With their immense strength and precision, elephants like these can lift up to one ton of timber and drag it for up to a kilometer. Elephants are ideal for terrain like this, where using heavy machinery would destroy far more of the forest. By noon, their work is done. The logs are stacked downhill. Later, they will be dragged further to the road, where trucks can load them in the dry season. With the afternoon free, Dr. Mio Nezar now has an opportunity to check on the elephant's health. What do you look for when you inspect an elephant? I check their movements and whether they have wounds or injuries on their bodies. Firstly, I check the tongue. The tongue should be pink in colour, but if it becomes lighter, it is likely to have anemia. These elephants are well looked after, but with the reduction in logging, many privately owned elephants face a bleak future. If they are old elephants, they will probably be sold. But it's illegal to sell them. They might be sold in the black market. We don't know about that. Ivory, skins or tusks can't be sold here. That's why they might be taken over the border. Some will be released into the jungle like cows and oxen. Elephants from Myanmar are already being smuggled into neighboring Thailand for the tourist trade. Activist Soraida Salwala has seen the plight of out-of-work elephants. She says they are often vulnerable to trafficking, exploitation and abuse. I don't like to see elephants in tourism, actually. I would like to see the government at least have the sanctuaries for them to stay. And people can just go there and visit them. So they play in the water, they don't have to entertain us, you know, with tricks or paint, painting something, no. I meet environmentalist U On at the Royal White Elephant Park in Yangon. U On is a retired senior forester who now chairs a major wildlife NGO. 
He says a solution must be found for out-of-work timber elephants. Government alone cannot do everything. The government, stakeholders, and local people, those uh, associated with the elephant, those close to the elephant uh, in the jungle, they are all responsible. Uh, they, can, they must love the elephant. And uh, to love the elephant, they must love the natural forest. But he believes releasing captive elephants back into the wild may worsen human elephant conflict. Elephants, they lost their habitat because of degradation. But when they lost their habitat, they, they, have, they lost their uh, food chain as well. Not much uh, fora in the jungle. And they, so the conflict between the people, uh, cultivation people, farmer, and the elephant is very serious. Across Asia, conflict between humans and elephants is on the rise. In this attack in India, a wild elephant emerged from the jungle and went on a rampage in a nearby town. Disoriented, it attacked a buffalo and later fatally wounded a man. In Myanmar too, elephants are running out of space, with commercial plantations taking over the forest. Two months ago, nine-year-old Panita came home to discover his family's hut had been destroyed by wild elephants, looking for food. Luckily, his family was not home at the time. With no house, his mother sent him off to train as a novice monk. On another occasion, a man was killed in the village by an angry elephant. Yet, Panita bears no grudge. Elephants don't do anything. It's not their fault, but the people's, because people go and live in the jungle. The elephants have to live in plantations and fields to survive, and are surrounded by houses, so they have nothing to eat. They eat various types of food, but they're not satisfied, so they eat rice in the paddy fields. Back at Teatsan village, Zawen is on a break from work and spending time with his family. His 12-year-old son, Tantzin Mong, wants to follow him and become an Uzi. But although Zawen is fiercely proud of his heritage, he has firm ideas on his son's future. Nowadays, the work sites are further and further away. I'm worried he won't be able to survive like us. He doesn't look like he can do this. That's why I don't want him to be an Uzi. Most Uzis barely complete primary education and only earn around $100 a month. Zawen wants more for his son. At dusk, Zawen offers incense to the two spirits of the forest. One protects the forest, the other protects the elephants. But relying just on the spirits may not be enough. as Myanmar opens its doors to the world and reforms its logging industry. Many are wondering if the ancient tradition of man working with elephants has a future. What is certain is that change is on the horizon for the world's last timber elephants. <laughs>